Hello and welcome to this special conversation. If there's one group that has captivated the market's imagination and fancy over the last one year, it's probably the Mahindra Group. m and stock price has made it one of the best performing stocks on the Nifty in the last 12 months. The company has held the first of its kind investor day in its history where it's interacting with over 300 investors. And one can understand why, because the excitement and uh, the anticipation around the group is really palpable. Well, the CNBC TV18 team is here to talk with the top brass at m and to understand what the strategy ahead is going to be for all of the flagship businesses of the group, as well as the companies that m and calls its gem portfolio. Well, well, we have with us the, the first set of the top leaders of uh, Mahindra and Mahindra. Uh, we have with us Dr. Shah, who is the group CEO and MD. We have uh, Mr. Barua, who is the group CFO. And of course, Rajesh Yajurikar, who is, of course, uh, you know, a known favorite on the channel as well, who is going to tell us more about the strategy for the auto and the farm equipment sector. Gentlemen, thank you so much for taking out the time. I know it's, it's a hectic, busy day for you, 300 investors. But uh, Dr. Shah, let me start with you. And I want to start with the big picture, because clearly since you came over, a lot changed. I remember, I mean, Nimesh and I and all, all of us, we remember the era where Sangyong happened, a lot of different sort of acquisitions happened, and then there was a refocus, there was a change in strategy, a shift away from the old erstwhile loss-making businesses, or the, the bets were not, which were not strategic, and a focus on where value can be generated. So that stage has happened. What next for the group? So, Ruby, I want to first start by saying that growth and returns has been in our DNA. So if you look at Mahindra Group going back to 2002, we were in fact the fastest and the best performing stock in the Nifty for 17 years, from 2002 to August 2018. We have now reclaimed that position, but it's been something that the group has been used to doing for a long time. Yes, there were some lessons along the way, we fixed those, but for us it's about continuity and change. The road ahead is more of the same. Keep our head down, focus, execute well, and grow our businesses. Mm -hmm. Anish, uh, you know the big uh, difference after you coming in in 2015-16 and until now, uh, I think what market has appreciated is the capital allocation and you've been talking about it in every uh, every forum that that's going to be the key focus. Uh, we've seen that uh, over a period of last three, four years that that's been the key mantra for you. Is that going to continue? And from that perspective, how do you justify uh, you know buying a small stake in Arbil Bank? So capital allocation for us is about strong execution is delivering on what we commit. If we acquire something and we forecast 20% returns, we should deliver 21%. Uh, it's not just about exiting businesses. That's the easy part. Actually, it's not that easy, but that is one that is easier than delivering on commitments. And RBL Bank was, in many ways, a treasury investment with a strategic option. It is a 400 crore investment in a sector where we've got 40,000 crores at stake. For the benefit of viewers, 4,400 crores in the auto business, over 6,300 crores in the farm business, and almost 7,000 crores in the services business. What's the plan? And, and again, uh, more numbers here. I know you're looking to invest, I think, 27,000 crores in the, uh, in the farm and the automotive sector over the next three years. 12,000 crores in EV. Let me not bore viewers with more numbers. But that's, uh, that's serious uh, you know, money commitment as well. So just tell us what the, the key growth focus areas are going to be. So we've got three areas of growth. First is auto and farm, where we're going to capitalize on market leadership. Uh, both businesses have significant growth drivers, and in fact, our investors appreciated that a lot today. In fact, many came up and said, we didn't realize the level of growth drivers you have even for the farm business, while auto is more well recognized. Second is unlocking full potential in Tech Mahindra and Mahindra Finance. Both are businesses that are very strong franchises. Uh, both have had some struggles in the recent past and have underperformed their peers, uh, but the lessons from there have put significant plans for growth over the next few years. Mahindra Finance is well on the path to turnaround. Tekem with Moe Joshi coming in has just commenced its turnaround. And uh, both are businesses that I think are, are going to be very good for the investor and, and obviously for the group. And then the third is our growth gems. This is a set of 10 businesses. All of them have great potential. Uh, we have increased the valuation of growth gems over the last four years. Uh, by 5x from roughly 0 0.8, 0 0.9 billion to about 4.2 billion at the end of uh, the last fiscal year. And uh, these are therefore the three growth drivers for us. So we'll speak about the gem companies with, in the next set. But, you know, uh, Jujurikar, uh, coming to you, because you spoke about farm 
and the auto as a, as a big growth driver. Uh, how are you taking this vision forward and what are the key things that you will be focusing on in terms of execution next year? Yes, yeah, so I'll try and uh, invest. Thanks for the question and thanks for being here with us today. Uh, on the farm equipment side, you know, one qu question which has been on a lot of people's mind is has the tractor market saturated? And you know, that question tends to kind of come with the heated intensity when there's a one time, one year down cycle. Uh, and we know that this industry is, you know, is cyclical and yeah, and you, you know, we that's doesn't take away from the fact that in the last 15 years it has had a CAGR of about 7% plus. But what we did put out today, and I, I guess you've seen that data, is there are several growth drivers for the tractor market here. We are very far from saturation, and we would expect to see you know the industry grow at a faster rate as we go forward because fundamentally to meet the food needs of India, uh, the farm productivity has to improve, and it's not going to improve without greater level of mechanization, as well, especially because there's much more inter intercrop uh, cultivation going on. There is a uh, decreasing labor force availability. So there are several enabling factors to mechanization. And hence, uh, it is an imperative of the government to get a greater level of mechanization to meet the food needs of the country. So that's one key driver. Uh, the second one is around, you know, opportunity in global markets. And we will recently launched the OJA, which is actually four platforms, as th th you know, three are ready, one is under work, which allows us to get into new markets, but also strengthens our position in some of the big markets we are in, like North America and so on. So, I, I, you know, just in a summary, these are two big growth drivers. On the auto side, uh, you know, we. Everybody wants to listen about the new launches and what more excitement there is yeah, that they're going to bring yeah, to the market. Yeah, yeah. So maybe we can talk a, about that. It's a, it's a very uh, sort of heavy pipeline as well, right? I think nine ICEs, uh, say, uh, SUVs, you're looking at, of course, the Bond Electric portfolio, expanding that as well. So lots of launches lined up. Tell us a little more also on, on, the, on the EV side where you're putting 12,000 crores to work over the next three years. Yeah, so uh, let me quickly, you know, take on the ICE portfolio first and then we'll talk about electric as kind of two different levers. So on the, uh, so when we actually had a slide, you would have seen that on market mapping. And there's one part of the market where, which is 50% of the industry, where our overall volume market share is 18 and a half or so, and we are number two by volume, number one by revenue market share. But in 50% of the market, our volume market share is 13%. Uh, so we have a big opportunity to gain share there and products which we've recently launched the 3XO allows us to do that. Uh, you know, so, so there is, there is, uh, we are number five in that segment of, in the, of, compact. In the segment. compact segment uh, by way of rank. So, you know, and we think we really have a strong proposition with 3XO which can make us number one or number two or three years. So there's a lot we can do in ICE, many new products, some uh, refreshes, uh, mid-cycle enhancements, as we call them, some completely new products. So, and we want to stay invested in ICE because at least 70% of the market three years from now will be ICE. Uh, the Bonn Electric portfolio, which we launched in 2025, is actually about a lifestyle experience, and uh, uh, you know we are looking we are looking less at here's an EV option. It's more about here is a emotionally charged uh, new SUV, which is superly designed, tech driven, fun to drive. And you know, it's the kind of thing you should want to buy with a lot of emotions. Emotionally and there are some, charged, that, yeah, that's a nice and, and there's, there's, a, there's a very, very strong rational reason but as the well. The challenge is, you know, there is a lot of waiting period to buy your uh, your car. So yeah, it takes you know almost eight, eight, my, eight months, nine months, or almost a year now to. We, get into we are very focused on trying to bring that down, right. and uh, uh, we have done that, quite a bit of that in the recent past. Yeah, we, we have triple capacity, which has helped get those waiting times down significantly. Let me ask you one more thing, because you folks have done phenomenally well on the SUV side, right? Pretty much the, the flag bearers and everybody else entered. And you know, interestingly, we're talking at a time where we might be seeing one of your peer companies, global peers, come out with a listing as well. So big times for the sector. Uh, how confident are you about maintaining this rate of growth? I know you're guiding on SUVs. I think you're guiding for mid to high teens growth in in this year, FI25. But how competitive is the market, and how confident are you of maintaining your position? Uh, the market is competitive yep. because now 60% of the passenger vehicle industry is SUV. So exactly. it's, it is the main industry. It's no longer the thing that you did on the side. Yeah. Uh, so we, it is the mainstay of the industry, and uh, which is why we feel good about the fact that even though we have the highest average price point, we are number two by way of volume. 
So we're doing more than 40,000 vehicles with the highest average price, uh, and which is what makes us number one by revenue market share. And I think that's a reflection of the very strong product portfolio we have. Uh, and many people who bought our products, the new products in the last three, four years, are actually creating that uh, set of you know positive word of mouth or enablement. You know, as we were talking in the corridor right now, when three people say, oh, you know, we drove this product of yours, it's a wow, it gets three more people to say, let me also have it. <laughs> uh, Mr. Baba, uh, you are in the hot seat now. You know, they all spoke about the kind of investment they're going to do. Uh, you being a CFO, how are you managing the entire cash flow for the groups? And which are the key areas where you think there's going to be major investments over the next couple of years? Uh, so, first of all, I just want to say that, uh, you know, Anish has made my life easy as a CFO because he has set a very uh, stringent requirements for how we deploy capital. So I think that part has, done, has, uh, has got a lot of discipline. What I have to ensure, though, is after we put in the capital, we actually realize the returns, right? So there is a lot of rhythms that we run internally that the CFO office has to enable. Um, so that's one one thing that I just wanted to highlight. In terms of where we are going to deploy capital, you already heard uh, some of the areas. We've also today talked about one new area that we have uh, been looking at for a while. Um, in fact, you know, uh, we probably get 10 opportunities a month, and we have looked at them in depth and and basically said it doesn't meet our two very stringent criteria. Right? It has to be meaningful. We have to have a clear right of win. Um, uh, and and uh, that's kind of a big part of what my job is. You just heard about the automotive business and, of course, the farm equipment side of the business. Now it's time to talk about the group's ambitions when it comes to IT, technology, as well as finance. So let me reintroduce, of course, uh, Dr. Shah, who's been in conversation with us. And joining him now, Mohit Joshi, MD and CEO of Tech Mahindra. And we also have Raul uh, Rubello. Uh, who's the MD and CEO at Mahindra Finance. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining in the conversation. So I want to open with Mohit. Mohit, because I remember this categorically, this was a conversation that Dr. Shah was having with Shreen, I think about you know six, seven months back yes. in his office. Mm -hmm. And he called it out and he said that, no, my focus is going to be on Tech Mahindra as well. We have to go for growth. We have to sort of look at, uh, you know, uh, margins would be, which would be at, you know, at, perhaps at parallel levels with the industry. And since then, there's been this tall ask ahead, right? 500 basis points improvement in margin. So do you have sleepless nights or, or how do you manage I, I, that expectation? I sleep, uh, very well at night. I feel that these are all uh, reasonable, realistic expectations and we have laid it out, right? I think since that interview uh, in April of uh, this year, so just about a month and a half back, we laid out a very comprehensive multi-year plan about where we plan to take uh, tech M. We spoke about our plan for revenue. We spoke about our plan to improve productivity and to improve margins. But most importantly, we spoke about the plan for the organization, right? We're not looking at one quarter or one year. We're looking at a multi-year plan, right? So to really create an organization that goes toe-to-toe -to -toe against uh, the best of international competitors and wins, I feel we have a comprehensive plan, including more than a 500 basis point expansion plan. And by, by, by when? So I'm, I'm sorry, but allow me to get into sure. small nitty gritties over here. The reason we sort of ask you this is that the environment, as a lot of your peers also tell us, perhaps still hasn't changed. You tell us what you're reading in, in terms of you know, demand growth, in terms of any acceleration or pickup in spends. And in, in how much time do you think you can achieve this 500 uh, basis points margin expansion milestone? So I think what we've spoken about, the fact that we will uh, deliver a 15% EBIT margin by 527. And so that is the plan. It's a three-year plan. Again, uh, I'm very reluctant to give you know quarterly or near-term targets because there is a lot of volatility, right? And because, as we've said, we're in the middle of a turnaround story. In the first year, you should expect volatility. You should expect us to go, you know, two steps forward, one step back, because that is the nature of the business, right? We're also investing heavily in the business to create the foundation for long-term success. But we've given a very clear expectation of where we expect to be from a growth perspective, from a return on capital perspective, from a free cash flow perspective, and from margin perspective by FY27, and to build, a, really, to build on what already is a world-class franchise. Well, uh, Moth, uh, let's push you a little bit on that point then. You know, in terms of margin improvement, I think you're looking at also leveraging group synergies. So tell us how much is that going to contribute in terms of this entire improvement? And also in terms of a revenue mix, what about the diversification away from uh, the telecom space? 
Sure. So I think, look, uh, you know, we're not looking at group synergy to deliver margin improvements. What we're saying is the group is such a wonderful asset for us. Right? It really is a force multiplier for us. Mm -hmm. So I think of group synergy in three different themes, right? The first theme is how do we deliver services to the group? See, the group is increasingly, every single uh, offering or product the group has will increasingly have technology as a larger component. So to that degree, Technology is the golden thread that runs across all the Mahindra businesses. How do we work with the auto business? We already work very closely with Rahul in the uh, financial services business. So how do we serve these businesses best as a preferred uh, supplier from a technology perspective? The second piece is the Mahindra Group has a wonderful set of ecosystem partnerships and relationships across the world, whether it's in Japan or in the U.S. or all parts in between. There are very strong supplier partner, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, ecosystem relationships that we can leverage to, you know, to build our own tech and business. But the third part, which is the most exciting, is how do we build, uh, you know, platforms for the future using Mahindra know-how and tech and technology expertise and maybe a third party as well, right? How do you work with the hyperscalers, the chip companies to build platforms that are truly next-gen? So the Mahindra synergy is not about cost savings. There will be some elements of cost savings as we ride on a common infrastructure for procurement, for instance. But the synergy is really about serving the Mahindra group effectively, using the ecosystem and the supply relationships to build our business and about building next generation platforms really you know for the industry uh, from a growth perspective look again we've said we want to retain our leadership position in telecom and manufacturing there is no stepping back from that there is no road to uh, tech mahindra success that does not go through uh, you know success in telecom and success in manufacturing but i also believe that we have the capability and the opportunity to be really a very credible challenger from a financial services perspective from a healthcare life sciences perspective maybe from a retail perspective so those are things that we will use to build the business as we become more scale in those industries uh, but we're not stepping back from telecom or manufacturing all right i'll just add to the group synergy part which is we want each of our businesses to be tech leaders in their industries okay. and this is where techm is a huge asset for the group yeah. uh, not just for gen ai which is more recent and we've got multiple uh, initiatives around Gen AI, but looking at every single technology, uh, looking at quantum, looking at metaverse, there are multiple opportunities across the group to create use cases at scale that Tekken can take to its customers. So therefore, there's a huge benefit to be able to leverage this synergy. Is, is there a number that you could uh, share as you go through this whole uh, turnaround process in terms of just revenue breakup, uh, let's say by FI 26-27, how much would be group and, and non-group? Well, I, I don't expect that the direct group uh, revenue component would be very significant, to be honest. Uh, it will be meaningful, but not really significant from a revenue perspective. What is more important, I think, is the level two piece, you know, uh, the partnerships the group has, and the level three piece, using the group expertise. Like we spoke about the factory of the future today, right? The hyper-connected, hyper-automated factory of the future that we have already built in Chakan, right? So to showcase that, to build next generation platforms based on the IP that we already have built for the group. Okay, all right, let's get Raul into the conversation then. Raul, you know, the street is quite bullish on prospects of Mahindra Finance, so delivery is going to be very, very important. Give us a couple of numbers, the credit cost guidance. You know, the market's looking forward to some kind of reduction on that front. So could you tell us the timeline and where does that number head to? And on the cost to, uh, you know, the cost ratios as well, that's relatively higher. If I compare the cost to income with some of the peer group, it's a little bit relatively higher. So guidance on both those two, credit cost as well as cost to income. Sure, thanks, Nigel. Thanks, it'll be great to be here. So on the credit cost, you're right, we've been slightly higher than the peer set. Uh, and uh, if you just watched us for the last two years, I think there's been, we've been trending down, right? right? And even the inter-quarter volatility has been largely addressed. Uh, we closed last year at 1.7. Uh, we've historically, if you look at credit costs, it's a summation of provision and write-offs. Yeah. What's really coming down is the write-offs. That's the actual loss. It used to be in the 2.5 range, that number's really slid down which gives us confidence and it also gives us a reflection of the underwriting we're doing for the new book because the stage two and stage three are at record low levels. We closed at 8.4. If you even wind back and look at the you know, previous benign seasons, we were never at those levels. So structurally, credit costs is slated to go down because the stage two and stage three composition itself yeah. is shrinking. 
what's happening behind the scenes is a lot of uh, grunt work on underwriting on asset quality i mean the kind of assets we're selecting up front so this is something which is trending well and which will hold us in good stead for the future so declining credit costs what about the cost to income cost to income see we were at a very sweet spot uh, you know we were in the low 30s uh, and now we a couple of years we've been in the in the mid 40s yes uh, we are we're kind of putting a, a very high bar to get back to the mid 30s in the next 2 3 years uh, the complex thing is that when you're in a transformation zone you're investing heavily in technology you're investing for growth also in distribution so you don't want to be penny wise pound, pound foolish uh, we've been investing in the last 2 years in possibly uh, tech digital which we have not done for the previous 7 years so that's cost up front uh, but that will really drive a lot of growth for the future if you want to give us a number on the credit cost number the cost to income we got it comes back down to the mid 30s in the next 2 to 3 years as you explained to us uh, the credit cost you want to give us a number see i can give you uh, range numbers because yes. uh, you know this is a business which is a high name business right and our business models includes funding uh, new to credit customers close to prime customers so we do have a a higher nim to absorb anywhere between a 1.2 to 1.5 uh, credit cost okay, 1.2 to 1.5 rahul I, i want to talk about growth uh, as you see not just this year but perhaps uh, another year or two down the line what is the the growth in the book that you will set out to sort of aim for uh, if you could give us some range that would help and all segments i mean housing has been a big segment for you i mean is it going to be more finance which sectors are you going to target over the next one to two years Yeah, so if you've uh, if you've watched Mind of Finance, we've been uh, we've had our moats. We have a lot of strength in the wheels business. Uh, even today, it's 94 percent of our business. Uh, we think that diversification is required. We've just crossed one lakh crores of assets under management. So the real growth going forward will be, or the themes would be, to protect market share in wheels. We are sitting at a very uh, a position of strength. We need to protect that. We've got high market shares across the wheel segment. we are looking at growing two more meaningful segments the sme and the mortgage segment mm -hmm. and you know these three segments constitute 65% of the retail lending anyways mm -hmm. uh, both the uh, the mortgage and sme are relatively new so it is going to be a lot of focus and execution uh, going forward growth if you look at these three together have been growing anywhere between 12 to 15% it's really the unsecured growth which has been high of late so uh, we are uh you know fashioning for the same growth as industry in wheels but our growth in mortgages and sme will be much higher dr shah you know we have the tech uh, head as well as we have the financial head they're both talking about growth it's organically right any in inorganic growth plans on either of these two no. no there may be some token acquisitions from a tech em standpoint for some capability building but the primary focus is going to be core execution and uh, both businesses are very well set up for that as you heard from uh, both our leaders yeah. and uh, we feel uh, very bullish about them in terms of just what's the chatter out there everyone in the market has been waiting for a pick up in it spends better environment better mood uh, is any of that around the corner i think things are certainly looking better than they did uh, you know a year ago and from our perspective look we have a new strategic narrative of scale at speed we have reorganized the uh, the organization so we also have our own uh, uh, internal tailwinds uh, working for us but i would say that uh, it's less dire than it was a year ago and it certainly seems like uh, things are going to get better 6 to 12 months down the line further